So hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Mark Kaplan. I'm the CEO of Alpha Loft. I'll tell you a little bit about that in a moment. I'm also the chair of the Capital Access Committee of the Live Free and Start Advisory Council, which you'll hear about also. Um, I'm pleased to have, that, have the opportunity as a result to welcome you today. And today would not be possible but for our sponsors, so I want to make sure they get appropriate, uh, appropriate attention. They are the New Hampshire Business Finance Authority, the Department of Resources and Economic Development, and UNH Innovation. Uh, with regard to the, there will be people, there are people here from the Department of Resources and Economic Development. Justin is here. Uh, Lorna is here. Uh, Jack Donovan from the BFA will be here. Uh, Ian Grant is here from UNH Innovation. I mentioned Ian because, uh, because Ian has just joined uh, UNH Innovation as the director of the Paul Entrepreneurship Center at UNH. So I hope uh, all of us will take a chance to uh, get to know Ian better uh, because he will be an important part of the startup ecosystem here in New Hampshire in his new role. I want to give you a brief overview of LFS. LFS is Live Free and Start. Live Free and Start is a joint initiative of the Governor's Office, the New Hampshire Business Finance Authority, and the Department of Resources and Economic Development. And it's a little hard to believe, but Live Free and Start was only started in June of 2014. And in a relatively short period of time, a lot has been accomplished. Live Free and Start's primary goals are to make New Hampshire a better place for innovation-based and technology companies to start up and grow. It's to support the work being done by the entrepreneurial ecosystem in New Hampshire uh, through the Business Incubator Network and, um, and other ecosystem partners, to market New Hampshire as a good place to start and grow technology and innovation-based companies, and uh, live free and start evidence today is interested in increasing access to capital for New Hampshire startups. I want to mention Liz Gray, who's New Hampshire's Director of Entrepreneurship. If you didn't meet Liz, I suggest you say hello. Uh, this event today was uh, put together by Liz uh, with a supporting cast of committee members. And so we have a lot to thank her for in, in all of her work. The Live Free and Start Advisory Council is comprised of 14 people who are um, high-tech entrepreneurs, business leaders, ecosystem partners, and they provide strategic input and recommendations to the state to support the ecosystem and startups. Um, in this past year, Live Free and Start launched an interactive website. If you haven't been to it, I encourage you to take a look. Uh, it is a wealth of information, resources, uh, links to resources, as well as content that's updated on a regular basis. And the objective is to really bring New Hampshire's startup ecosystem together. We have a social media presence on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Uh, if you're not following at Live Free Start, please do on Twitter. Uh, if, you, if you are on Twitter and you tweet, the hashtag for today is uh, hashtag uh, uh, NHinvest. LFS also launched last year the Ultimate Connection Competition. This was an opportunity for entrepreneurs to compete for an opportunity to have a meeting with the governor and a host of uh, industry leaders from the industry that they, um, from which their startup comes. Um, that was a very successful competition, both in terms of the number of competitors uh, the winner was a company called Pickup Patrol. Uh, they're an early stage company here in New Hampshire. I'm proud that, uh, to say that they were a part of Alpha Loft's first accelerator program, Accelerate NH, that ran this, uh, earlier this year. In the legislative arena, Live Free and Start was a, an advocate and supporter and uh, pusher of, of an act that modernizes New Hampshire's uh, securities legislation. Uh, Basically, this, is, uh, this was a full uh, rewrite to a large degree. Michael Roof is here. He had a, a big hand in that, as did Matt Benson, uh, who you'll meet momentarily. Uh, that has a big impact on uh, companies that are starting here, companies that are raising capital here. Uh, in addition, there was legislation that modified New Hampshire's business name availability. 
uh, standard. This removed a lot of subjectivity in the process that was extremely frustrating to many entrepreneurs and small business people who were simply trying to get a name. So fortunately, uh, that, is, that has happened as well. The governor and Live Free and Start also supported, the governor put forward some funding in the budget to support the ecosystem through the New Hampshire Business Incubator Network uh, members. There are five nonprofit incubators in the state that are working with entrepreneurs throughout the state. Um, we're pleased that uh, even after all the wrangling that went on and, and all of that, uh, that uh, there's $107,000 in the budget that will go towards education and acceleration activities uh, for New Hampshire entrepreneurs. Um, those types of activities are the work of, of our organization at Alpha Loft and the other incubators. The way I think about that is that we're working hard to increase the preparedness of entrepreneurs for the marketplace they're going into and for the process potentially of raising money from angels and venture investors. And that preparedness is not just getting started and understanding their business model, but understanding the kinds of things they're going to go through and understanding how they're going to have to execute once they do potentially raise money. So I look at our job in the incubator system is to kind of raise the bar so that when you all uh, who are angel investors and hopefully some of you who will become angel investors are seeing stronger deal flow uh, that makes more sense, that has a compelling value proposition, and therefore is more investable. So that's really why we're hosting this workshop today, because we have an incubator network in New Hampshire. We have a lot of people who are boosting our startup ecosystem. But uh, one of the things that we believe is missing is, uh, or, or needs to be improved, is access to capital for startup founders. And so our goal today is really to work on increasing that level of activity, bringing more accredited investors into the fold uh, who have a desire to become angel investors on some level, uh, to make money, to be more engaged with some companies here in the state, and ultimately to help create some companies that are going to grow to significance and create high quality jobs here in New Hampshire. So that's really our overall objective uh, today. You know, we've already met part of our goal, which is engagement. We have a room full of people, who, some of whom are angels, or are thinking about becoming angels. So engagement is an important part of what today is about. Uh, education is another component of today's activity. We have a couple of breakout sessions that we'll describe a little bit more later um, for both the new prospective angel investor as well as uh, those who are already investing will have an opportunity to look at some trends in the marketplace. And finally, uh, connection, providing opportunities for uh, both prospective and best existing participants in angel networks to get to know one another, uh, all in an effort to enhance the capital available for startup entrepreneurs, presuming that we can do a good job preparing them for that, for that process. Um, everybody uh, hopefully grabbed an agenda uh, out front. I think it's pretty self-explanatory. When it's time to go to the breakout sessions, I'll, I'll help steer you. Um, we do want um, everyone hopefully to feel very comfortable in the environment that we're trying to put together both here in the large session as well as the breakout sessions. Um, no question is a question that shouldn't be asked if you haven't. Have a whole story about not asking a specific question at a particular point in my career um, that was unfortunate. So uh, there is no bad question. Don't be intimidated by anybody else in the room. Um, we hope that you will uh, follow uh, the event on Twitter and perhaps tweet yourselves. Um, with that, I would like to turn the podium over to Matt Benson of Cook Little Rosenblatt and Manson. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, congratulations on finding parking uh, and making it here. I know that that's been uh, a little bit uh, of an issue for some of you, but uh, glad you could all make it. I think it's going to be a great day, um, and hopefully it will be one of the many steps that we'll follow with Live Free and Start to help make capital more accessible in the state. Um, as the um, chairman of the Live Free and Start Advisory Council, I've had an opportunity to work on some of the things that Mark talked about with Mark and a bunch of others. Uh, and it's been great. I've also had an opportunity to experience uh, the, the push that we've had uh, from the inception of Live Free and Start, which as Mark pointed out, 
um, was heavily promoted in the beginning from the governor's office. And to have the governor consistently pushing uh, on many of the initiatives that we were working on, including the New Hampshire Securities Act. And it's some of that help from the top that I think has helped uh, Live Free and Start get to where we are with some of the things that we've been done so far. Um, I appreciate the governor's support from the beginning. I appreciate the governor's continuing support as we move forward uh, to make New Hampshire an even better place for, for entrepreneurs. And with that, I'd like to invite the governor up to uh, share a few words. Governor Thank you, Matt, uh, for the introduction, and thank you to the entire Live Free and Start team. Uh, I am also very glad that people found parking um, and glad you all took time to be part of this conference today. Uh, I have not met yet the <coughs> keynote speaker, Sandra Stone. I had a feeling that might be you, because I saw you taking notes. Welcome and thank you for being here. Uh, to everyone participating in today's conference, um, and everybody who has an interest in learning more about <coughs> angel investing in the Granite State, thank you for being here. Um, our state's entrepreneurial spirit is truly a defining characteristic. We work hard here, we persevere, we innovate. We literally built a state out of granite, which takes some doing. We are a great place for innovative startups, and we want more people to know that. Uh, New Hampshire was recently ranked fifth in the country for entrepreneurship, and we're working towards becoming the best place in the country for entrepreneurship. The whole idea of Live Free and Start was really about bringing business leaders and entrepreneurs together, focusing on making it easier for startups to grow here and then to thrive here. Uh, as uh, as uh, Mark mentioned, uh, Live Free and Start has really been a critical initiative for helping us pass key bipartisan bills this year in terms of modernizing our securities regulations and easing the process for registering a business. And then what has really been critical in organizing today's Angel Investing in the Granite State Conference. Uh, we have been hearing uh, loud and clear that access to capital is a critical, critical part of helping innovative businesses grow here in New Hampshire and to thrive here. And we need to have, businesses need to have access at each stage of their growth. Angel investors are an important source of that capital for startups and other, other early stage companies. So today's conference is about learning more about entrepreneurship, innovation, and startups in New Hampshire, connecting all of the various uh, people here from the various sectors um, who need to be talking to each other and learning more about each other, and really helping investors explore opportunities around angel investing in New Hampshire. Um, I really look forward to hearing about today's takeaways uh, as the conference uh, unfolds. I'm not going to be able to stay with you uh, the entire afternoon, but uh, Liz Gray, my Director of Entrepreneurship, will certainly brief me. I look forward to continuing our work together to support innovative businesses and keep New Hampshire's economy moving forward. Um, when I think about innovation and entrepreneurship in the Granite State, it means a number of different things to me, um, and I suspect it means some different things to different people who are here uh, with different perspectives. But to me, it means innovators who have great potential not only to bring the next great thing on board to market, to our society, to our culture, to our economy, but to create jobs and support a high quality of life. It means to me that it's people working towards a level of independence and connection in New Hampshire, the freest state in the country, and one of the best places, if not the best place in the world. It means more than anything to me that people are focusing on what we do in New Hampshire, which is unleash the talent and energy of each and every single person among us so that they reach their full potential. They have the chance to innovate, to create, to work together, and to build an even better future. More than anything, we are a great state for entrepreneurs because we are a great democracy. And that really is what ties us all together. Entrepreneurship thrives in this state because democracy thrives. And you are all a part of that as well. 
So thank you for creating jobs, for helping us build the best state in the world to live in and to work in and to play in. And help and thank you also for ensuring a brighter future for each and every Granite Stater. I look forward to learning all about your conference today. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Appreciate that very much. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, our keynote speaker for this afternoon. For those who don't know me, I, I moved to New Hampshire only a few years back and spent many years up in the Portland, Maine area, uh, about 30 years, and I was quite involved in entrepreneurial activities and investing in that market for a long time. So I have known our speaker today for uh, 25, 30 years, something like that. Uh, but she's not here because I've known her for 25 or 30 years. Uh, she's here because of what she's done and what she can tell us and what we can learn from uh, what she has accomplished. Uh, Sandra Stone, who you will hear from momentarily, is the Chair Emeritus of Maine Angels. Uh, for the past four years, she's been Chair. The, the Angel Network in Maine is 70 plus uh, accredited investors who collaboratively collaboratively identify and vet promising early stage companies. Um, they, have, they are primarily located in the Portland area and have a subchapter in Bangor, Maine. In 2012, Maine Angels invested over $3.4 million in 21 companies and placed number 10 nationally in the number of deals done in the HALO report survey of active U.S. angel groups. In 2014, Maine Angels was again recognized by the HALO report, this time as number one nationally in number of follow-on deals done. In September of 2015, just a month and a half ago, Sandra turned out as chair. Uh, about the same time the HALO report named Maine Angels as the number three angel group in New England for the past three-year deal volume. In 2015, member investors in two portfolio companies had 5X and 7X returns. Sandra is the president of the board of a private grant-making foundation where she's been an active trustee since 1990. On the side, she was the head coach of the Falmouth High School girls tennis team for 13 seasons, winning state championship for 10. So you know we have a winner here. I am pleased to uh, welcome Sandra Stone. I'm Sandra Stone. I'm Chair Emeritus of the Maine Angels. I appreciate the invitation to come to Manchester today and speak to you about my experiences with angel investing uh, and growing the Maine Angel Investment Network over the past four years. As Mark mentioned, he and I go back to the 90s when we lived in the same Falmouth, Maine neighborhood, and our sons were about the same age. More relevant is our connection around 2008 when Mark was on the board of the Portland Entrepreneurial Accelerator Maine Center for Entrepreneurial Development, where I was the program manager for almost six years. There we go. Um, I mentioned this as it was during my time at the incubator in November of 2005, to be exact, that I made my first angel investment in cross-rate technologies one of the on-site incubated companies. I've observed how the two young co-founders researched discarded office furniture and whiteboards from the college campus where we were co-located, heard their complaints about the lack of heat at 2 a.m., and I was impressed that they were even trying to work there at the wee hours of the morning. And we regularly interacted as they diligently and passionately strove to advance their technology uh, location technology to commercialization. I could understand their concept of redundant ELORAN and GPS so that ground transportation, security, and naval assets would never find those proverbial pockets of that cell phone user's call the dead zone in the, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? 
scenarios. So I invested the last missing $10,000 to help match a technology grant to access over 100,000 in non-dilutive funding. I consciously bet on a team that I knew pretty well, thought had an idea that had potential, but it was a gut reaction to there being just two days prior to their deadline and in no way was it an analytical evaluation of the risk of government budget priorities, the market, references, business model, financial projections, or any real due diligence. So, as FYI, Crossrate Technology had an amazing multi-year run with multiple follow-on investments by myself, other main angels, and state funding programs. They ended up winning a million dollar contract with NOAA just prior to the federal government shopping support for the ELORAM system upon which their technology was based. A company, the company failed due to crazy budget balancing juggling move that cut the ongoing ELORAM maintenance expense from one budget while adding a much larger decommissioning cost to another. My instincts were not that seasoned, so it's no surprise that my investment advisor suggested that I consider exploring my interest in investing in early stage entrepreneur activities by joining the Maine Angels, Maine's only angel investment group. In 2008, I became a member to learn, about, to learn from the experience and wisdom of that network. We're now up to 70 plus members, and we collaboratively identify and vet promising early stage companies. And if more than five members are interested to dig a little deeper, we determine member co-leads who oversee and coordinate the due diligence and any term negotiations. Maine Angels is not a managed fund, nor a pooled fund where, where a majority thumbs up or thumbs down. Each member individually chooses whether or not and how much to invest in any potential deal. As an accredited investor, I value being part of an angel group for its access to Maine and New England deal flow the collective insights of its members, the inquiring questions and observations at a presentation Q&A, and member debriefs that I never would have thought of, and the multiple extended networks of resources that so many of my colleagues can bring toward the objective of getting to a profitable exit for both the investors and the entrepreneur. Angel investing is risky. The investor is taking calculated risks, and trying to anticipate and mitigate those risks as a new startup or emerging business. As an investor, I'm trying to evaluate those risks and the projected responses and opportunities uh, to be considered and go in with my eyes wide open for the prospective opportunity of a much greater return. The analogy to baseball, where batting 300 is considered excellent, is well taken. It is often said that the angel investor is looking for that one out of 10 that offsets all of the failed, or merely surviving, or just more patient, just getting on the base kind of hits. That's why, just like a stock portfolio, I value diversification, and I recommend a basket approach, having now invested in over 15 deals, some having multiple follow-on additional investments. I show the logos of several of my investments here. I, um, had four other of my investments fail besides Crossrate, but I also had my first successful exit this past year in a Boston syndicated deal where a VC came in at a much higher valuation, and I opted to sell my equity shares at a over 3.5x return in just over three years. I've kept a small interest to also take advantage of the company's continued growth. I have several other prospects I feel are strong, but I also note that I have an intentional bias towards investing in strong female entrepreneurs and a desire to help build the Maine ecosystem when possible. I'm also very keen on the fact that Maine has a seed capital tax credit of 50% over four years. This really incentivizes investment in qualified Maine companies. It in essence puts only half of my investment at risk, amplifying the potential return I could get if my bet is correct and the timing is not too drawn out. Back in 2008, I remember feeling almost envious of the developing New Hampshire startup community resources and ecosystem that I perceived when getting invitations to two different annual speed venture summits, sort of like speed dating for New England VCs and New Hampshire entrepreneurs, in which I represented Maine Angels, 
although no deal uh, deals were generated out of that. But also regular monthly updates of all the entrepreneurial forums, invites to monthly public-private pitch-offs, education workshops, and other shared resource events between the New Hampshire SBDC and the New Hampshire High Technology Council and the New Hampshire Innovation Commercialization Center. I actually remember forwarding an NHHTC email notice to a colleague at our Maine Technology Institute advocating for Maine to embrace a more collaborative approach to Maine systems building between the various advocacy, service, and counseling services. The best I could personally coordinate back then was a financing panel luncheon for entrepreneurs bringing together key investing and lending strategic partners as part of a Maine national Maine's recognition of the National Entrepreneurship Week that used to happen in February every year. It took small steps of event-driven collaboration to lead to heightened visibility, shared diligence, and risk as co-investors and um, charismatic champions to charge ahead. But now Maine's ecosystem has been evolving so that our alphabet soup, all those initials of resources, seems to be forming more strategic alliances and getting heightened visibility. This surge was jump by the Blackstone Accelerates Growth Initiative that was launched back in 2011 with $3 million from the Blackstone uh, Charitable Foundation out of New York. It's a philanthropic arm of the Blackstone Group. They're an investment firm that manages $248 billion in assets. And its goal was to serve as a catalyst for entrepreneurial activity in Maine. In October 2012, they created innovation hubs in Portland and Bangor to further their goal. Maine Technology Institute, or MTI, their acronym, plus two incubators, the one I had worked at that Mark was actually on the board of, the Maine Center for Entrepreneurial Development, and the Foster Center for Student Innovation at the University of Maine, were also partners in this Blackstone Accelerates Growth Initiative, commonly referred to as BXG. The new main initiative was part of the foundation's 50 million 10-year effort to grow entrepreneurship nationwide. Blackstone had made similar investments in Michigan and North Carolina, but this was the first effort made in a rural state, such as Maine. They targeted entrepreneurial curriculum, um, encouraging the innovation engineering curriculum at the University of Maine, and created stipends for summer interns to embed in emerging Maine innovating companies. They also increased in visibility, connectivity, and regular networking to virtually explode the ecosystem buzz and activity. They had two broad goals. First was giving Maine entrepreneurs and startups the resources they need. The other broader goal was to help build an intentional community and culture of innovation and entrepreneurship in the state. Partnering with existing Organizations already working on building entrepreneurial communities was the key to the growing involvement throughout the state. MTI chose to spread it over four years to enable making it sustainable after this year. So now we have Maine Accelerates Growth that we've morphed this uh, Blackstone Initiative into. Now all ecosystems are yet part of this new umbrella, uh, not all organizations are part of this new umbrella alliance, but several organizations are now collaboratively fundraising through the Maine Community Foundation, which um, attracts philanthropic dollars, and the incentive that the Maine Technology Institute is using the last of the Blackstone money to uh, match any charitable gifts up to 100000 The MCED incubator now has programming for an online Top Gun prep to the selective Top Gun Entrepreneur Accelerator Program in both Portland, or Orono, and Camden, thanks to the Blackstone Initiative. It's sort of similar to Massachusetts Techstars, um, but without the monetary uh, advance, but it does give out some showcase finale awards. We now also have a regular equity prep rec workshop for those who think they are ready for investor funding just to tell them about the sorts of things that an investor from the outside would expect. In June, we had our second annual Maine Startup and Create Week, a week-long national conference of over 75 events in um, seven days, celebrating innovators, entrepreneurs, and startups with a national speaker highlighted each day. In September, we were one of 14 city stops by Steve Case of AOL 
in his Rise of the West tour that selected Rapport, a sustainability software uh, creator, as the winner of eight vetted companies for a $100,000 investment. Maine also now has its own version of Shark Tank uh, called um, Greenlight Maine, which is on Saturday nights at 7.30 with 13 weeks of competing pairs and a pitch off to proceed to the finals. So where does Maine Angels fit in all of this activity? I, of course, know those specifics a little better. I can give some data points how we fit. Since inception, Maine Angel members have invested over 15.1 million in 61 emerging companies. Our investments have been of about 50% Maine, 50% New England, with the bulk of those New England deals being out of Boston. We also have a few investments out of the New England region due to a particular member's expertise, an inbound referral, or syndication by a known angel group. Our deal size is typically 10 to 10, sorry, 100,000 to 2.5 million, with an average raise um, for our group of around 250,000. And most usually an initial evaluation, pre-money valuation of around 2.5 million although those are apparently starting to rise as I read the different ARI uh, HALO report. We are typically invested about 60% post-revenue and about 40% pre-revenue. For larger raises, Maine Angels will attempt to syndicate with some of the other 20 plus angel groups in the New England ACA regional chapter. That's our National Angel Capital Association. We have quarterly syndication summits down in Boston where each um, angel group has a chance to nominate their best yet unfilled deals to be selected for pitching the attendees. I note that two of your groups uh, here in New Hampshire are already um, involved in that. The East Coast Angels in Portsmouth and the North Country Angels that list you know, in New Hampshire. I think they also are in Vermont. So, um, these are our investments over the last five years, our composite. As um, Mark noted, in 2012, Maine Angels invested 3.4 million in 21 companies. This was the strongest year since our inaugural investments in 2004, placing Maine Angels number 10 in the number of deals in a national um, survey of U.S. angel groups. For this, I was honored to be recognized by our statewide business weekly, uh, bi-weekly, the Maine Biz, as a 2013 woman to watch. It really was the angel group's uh, activity. In 2014, Maine Angels was again recognized, this time as number one nationally in the number of follow-on deals. That's when we make additional investments in companies already in our portfolio. Um, and then again, as Mark mentioned, two, years, two, two months ago, um, Maine Angels was recognized as, uh, for the third time by the HALO report as the number three angel group in New England behind Launchpad Angels of Massachusetts and Cherry Stone Angels of um, Rhode Island. Um, as I, we also noted, uh, depending on how you figure out your return, in 2015, member invest, investors in two of our portfolios finally had our first two exits. Um, one was, uh, I, I believe it was around 3.5 for a 2011 initial investment, and the other was upwards of 5.5 for a 2012 initial investment. Both had follow-on investments, so it depends how you calculate. So Maine Angels is still mostly a volunteer-driven uh, group, so group engagement is expected throughout the application process, beginning with active uh, engagement in area pitch, mentoring, and networking opportunities to discover and encourage entrepreneurs <coughs> to apply. We ask members to allocate five hours a month between opportunities to participate in pre-meeting screening sessions, perhaps following up with applicants that don't yet seem ready or need more active mentoring. We have the three-hour monthly meeting where members actively participate in Q&A with the two presenters and participate in a member and guest debrief discussion once the entrepreneur is excused. And or they can be part of a diligence team since after every presentation by an entrepreneur, members who are interested in the proposal form a working group with a designated deal lead. The members work collaboratively through the due diligence process, leveraging the group's expertise and connections, and negotiate a deal for all members to be able to consider it. Once due diligence is complete and deal terms have been established, 
Each member individually chooses whether or not to invest. Ongoing communications with the new business and their progress reports are documented and accessible at all times in a deal through our online investment management platform and the deal lead liaison. Just to talk a little bit about our process, um, deal process, um, I've listed the steps here of the online application, then the screening meeting, which happens um, 10 days before our monthly meeting, the invitation for a presentation, at, at which time we determine interest, and we look for a minimum of five members to be willing to continue to observe the deal, be part of the diligence team, and we need to have someone volunteer to step up as the deal lead. I know that only two to three presenters are usually invited per meeting out of sometimes 15 applications a month. Admittedly in Boston, the selectivity is even higher, but we try and remind our entrepreneurs that it is a selective process. And sometimes all, but sometimes none, elicit enough uh, interest to proceed to the next step. If diligence maintains enough interest, there is a report out to the other members to assess interest of those who might have missed the presentation or now have potential interest due to a positive assessment. And if acceptable term negotiations can be made, proceed to closing. If we are originating the funding and there is not enough interest capacity to tap out the full raise, a diligence report will be generated for outreach to our other main strategic partners such as the main venture fund which is our state VC or um, MTI which is our uh, R&D grant and does a little bit of equity or we have an organization called CEI uh, that does sometimes um, triple bottom line investments. Um, our criteria, what do we look for? A target company would have a capable management team, preferably with a track record of leadership and performance, a pressing need in the market for the solution, a scalable business model, an addressable market of potentially 100 million, limited capital expenditure requirements, clear understanding of the user or customer, demonstrated strategy to capture 20% of the market share in five to seven years, a clear actionable plan to reach milestones with the funds raised and an articulated exit strategy. Companies have to have a business entity, executive summary, or, bus or business plan, financial projections, and filled out our online application. In terms of sectors, we have no particular sweet spot. We now, as mentioned, have over 70 members with very professional expertise and interests. We sort of see which uh, deals our members seem to have um, a passion for or an interest in or bring something to the table. Um, so I attempted to pull together a slide here to point out some of the top sectors we have invested in. You'll note that all five in the retail investments have failed, so we're not too keen on those anymore. <laughs> Okay, so people ask how Main Angels ramped up its activities so much. I feel that it's an attention to membership growth. That's our target market is our members really. And the intentional outreach to other strategic partners, angel groups, and the ecosystem with the message that although selective in our choice of investment and partners, that Main Angels is actively seeking entrepreneur requests for funding and prospective new members. My vice chair and I were truly well plugged in to both the entrepreneur and strategic resource partner community. Don Gooding, my, my vice chair, uh, was the executive director of the Portland Incubator, having come there from the University of Southern Maine business plan competition from running that. And he's the one who's taking on the Top Gun Accelerator program, um, which is a natural source of potential deal flow for us. We started inviting strategic resource partners to a meeting so that they could better understand what we did and the type of investments and professional presentations that we would expect to see. We also actively encouraged our members to bring guests. And as chair, I followed up with each prospective member personally to assess their interest and encourage them to join. Note the growth of members from 30 in the first year, well, 31, uh, when Don and I took over uh, as leadership. Uh, after identifying in the last column that 20 were no longer active and dropped out. They weren't coming to meetings, investing, or even some of them still living in Maine, nor when I contacted them thought, I didn't even realize I was still a member. Um, 
but we have a required application fee of $1,000. It's a one-time thing. You can deactivate and reactivate based on that as long as you now pay what uh, we assess as an annual dues. Um, natural deactivation is expected as invest investor risk tolerance and investable cash changes. So we do um, see that we're starting to see a little more um, many of our members starting to deactivate. Um, usually we were estimating around five to ten a year, um, but we're also gaining uh, ten new members uh, almost annually. Um, and this is due to the fact that um, most people have an investment asset allocation target for their um, high-risk investments and tend to not want to see it be over 10% of their portfolio. But new members are an important um, aspect of building an angel group as they bring new energy that also means they're bringing in new entrepreneurial contacts their own funds so there's new funds to invest and an increased visible activity encourages more entrepreneurial interest and more member inquiries so it's a nice uh, upward spiral I also begin actively recruiting women investors as they bring a whole different approach to the question and diligence piece we instituted a spousal membership where both could join for the one application fee, one annual dues, but they would only get one vote. So I um, really started instituting at almost every single one of our meetings, encouraging our um, members to invite a guest. Um, we wanted guests to be someone that the member was willing to sponsor for membership and ask them to either bring in an accredited investor or a strategic partner in our innovation ecosystem. So that the uh, strategic partners, everyone from SCORE to SBDC um, to uh, outside uh, consultants that might either lawyers or CPAs um, that would work with entrepreneurs and would know whether to refer those entrepreneurs into us or whether they weren't ready and needed to go to some of our free resources of consulting help that are our partners in the system. We now ask, because of SEC regulations getting a little tighter, we now ask members to contact an officer for approval of those guest invitations, provide the prospect's email address and a short paragraph on what they can contribute to the group, and that they should only invite them to a, me a meeting at which they will be able to attend. Um, Guests are encouraged to listen and ask questions too. This gets them engaged, interested, and feeling like they're not they're sitting on the outside just observing. Um, our bylaws also require that prospective new members must attend a meeting, if only to get a better sense for what we do and how to do it. But it also introduces prospects to our officers, our active members, and it's important because our bylaws also require up to a two-week member comment period after any application is received for a new member. The slide notes our regular announcement to guests at every meeting about their attendance being for the purpose of learning about the main angels and not a solicitation. This is part of the SEC regulations that have just come into effect. We also request our guests to respect confidentiality. We ask that they uh, respect the confidentiality of both the entrepreneur's information that is being shared in the presentation and the identification of our members, um, since some of them choose to be very private and fly under the radar screen, so to speak, hoping to avoid unsolicited perpetual offers of business plans. We do try to work with eager and interested guests who want to invest and encourage their membership application so that they can do so. Um, our dues, just to give you a reference point, just went up to $450 a year. That's cheap by Boston standards. That can be over um, $1,500 to $2,500 for professional due diligence and uh, regular retainer for attorney fees. Um, our dues are due uh, the second year, the, the first year of application. Um, there is no dues. And these offset our monthly meeting costs of a continental breakfast and uh, boardroom set up and parking for up to 40 members at our um, meetings every month. This also covers our ACA membership, website costs, and um, administrative support. We now have a paid administrative assist uh, coordinator at 45 hours a month. Member payment of the annual dues, um, also the, the invoice has a statement that they're going to um, 
that, that paying those dues reaffirms that they um, want to remain active, which means that we expect their participation and their agreement to stay engaged and participate, as well as their acknowledgement that they are continue to be an accredited investor as defined by the SEC, and able to sustain the financial risks inherent in investments. And also, um, being part of the ACA New England Regional Group, we have something called the Home Har Hold Harmless uh, Treaty, which is our agreement of cooperation for due diligence sharing. I certainly don't want to share my diligence with you, even with my best intention, if I feel like I could come have somebody come back and try and sue me for what I felt was the best amount of uh, analysis that I could do. Um, we also, in uh, the advantage of asking for dues, ask them to affirm that um, although they're not legally obligated to invest in any opportunities um, presented, that the members are affirming that they are willing and able to invest in companies that Maine Angels presents to them, that they're prepared to invest our expectation of a minimum of 20000 a year and our total of 100000 over a five-year period of membership. And it acknowledges and accepts that Maine Angels records and reports all investments by members in a composite to the ACA so that we can be part of the HALO reports that are done nationally, and, but we um, do not disclose individual member names. So, um, Maine Angels has been attempting to streamline our response time through initially creating a pre-screening session, prioritizing member deal referrals, and we have attempted to bring in both educational workshops and promote those that are held down by the ACA in Boston as learning and networking opportunities for our new members. And in closing, I just want to stress that Maine Angels is still evolving. I have things I can learn here today from you. I hope to be part of the uh, leaders meeting, uh, I guess, over in the far room here. We're finding that we need to work on developing our systems and processes to more professionally manage the deal flow and the diligence. We have been exploring getting additional paid administrative help to, as I mentioned, the 45 hours a month. Um, it was almost a, a, a very full-time job for me to be running the uh, angel group over the last four years, and I've got other commitments that are making it really hard to um, other people to take on those roles. And they're now having six people kind of take over the roles that Don and I did, the two of us. But, um, so we've been exploring the possibility even of a part-time executive director um, if the current push to encourage more member participation falls short. But I'm excited to support the new leadership team up at Maine Angels, and we're looking forward to knowing a little more about the deals that you have here that we might be able to um, consider uh, for our investment dollars. So I wanted to stop here and leave some time for Q&A, but thank you. We do have a little bit of time built into our schedule for Q&A. Um, I will, uh, obviously, I'm looking for the audience to please uh, put up your hand. I'll, I'll come down with the microphone to ask questions. Um, while we're waiting for the first hand to go up, let me just ask you, uh, from a motivation standpoint, maybe you could talk a little bit about what motivated you in the first place. We have, we have both existing angel investors here as well as prospective angels. Uh, what motivated you to get involved in angel investing? What do you find is motivating the members that you're bringing on? And secondly, um, your set of expectations that you put forward, does that get in the way of some people's desire who think they're motivated but may not be? So somebody put up a hand for the next question, and I will work my way down. Okay, so um, what motivated me to get uh Excited, but as I said, I worked for six years in a, in a business incubator, watching the entrepreneurs entrepreneurs try to grow their businesses, and I love being around entrepreneurs. They just think outside the box. They're problem solvers. Um, no, is it necessarily uh, final? It's like okay, so how else can I go about doing that? I find it really interesting and exciting to be part of that process and to empower and enable other people. I don't want to have to work the 80 hours a week, but I'm more than happy to help support them do that. Um, 
I guess for other members, um, and as I said, I particularly am interested in supporting female entrepreneurs. Um, I feel that that's a, a, a networking um, chain that, that needs to happen. Um, very often it's not as comfortable, uh, and they aren't as well versed in some of the business things that they need to know. And it's easier sometimes for me to say, I, I need more information than that. That's just not sufficient. Some of my other members, um, many of them are successfully exited entrepreneurs, and they're motivated just to give back to other people in their field. They want to keep their fingers in sort of what's happening out there. Um, if you've been in telecommunications, staying involved in telecommunications, but not having to do it necessarily all over again. Um, feeling like you want to be able to be either, sometimes uh, my members are, uh, if they're a larger contributor, uh, investor, they'll either be on an advisory, a coach, a mentor, or even sometimes a board member in it. Um, particularly if you're sort of at that point where you're um, not working on a day-to-day -day basis, that gives you something that feels very powerfully productive and um, uh, meaningful to do. Great. I've spotted three people with questions so far. Feel free to continue raising hands. First question. Hi, Greg Chinaman from uh, 10X and Silver Tech. Uh, I had a question for you about uh, how you think deal flow, the idea of investing around a particular geography, um, and kind of AngelList and other kind of syndication platforms all come together in what you guys do. Or I guess or maybe they don't have any deal to do. <laughs> um, we're actively watching the whole crowdfunding um, uh, initiative that Maine came out with its own crowdfunding uh, regulations so that we could get started uh, early with that. Um, and I know we've had, um, uh, Don, my vice chair, was uh, very much um, more aware and versed in, in that. Um, Angelist has not been something that we've done a lot with. I know that when I go down to the um, regional summits in Boston, we talk about that a lot. But we're finding that um, for our members, they want to be able to feel like they can participate or really keep sort of um, um, uh, aware of what's happening in a business. And so it's almost like a little bit more provincial. We find that even New York seems to be a little far. They don't want to go and kick the tires down there. But Boston, New Hampshire, uh, Vermont, and Maine um, resonate well with our members. It would need to be a, 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 we have a couple in Pennsylvania, and that's because either the Connecticut or Launchpad group um, found them and brought them to us already with diligence, and we respect and trust them, so that we know they've done the diligence and that they will be on top of it. It would be unlikely for us to ever um, originate or syndicate out a deal that wasn't in Maine. I always inquire to our What percentage of the angels are women, and what percentage of the entrepreneurs are women? How do you encourage women to join the ecosystem? Okay, um, I should know those figures by that. But uh, let's see. I think I have, um, including spousal members, so that they're not um, necessarily members in their own right. I believe that 11% of our members are now uh, women, which was interesting. Back when I joined in 2008, there were several in the book, but usually myself or myself and one other were the only women in the room. Um, a lot of that is that I also am involved in women leadership organizations, and when I go to those organizations, I try to, uh, again, bring out that message that I am actively looking to recruit female uh, accredited investors. Um, sometimes the biggest obstacle to that is they're like, oh, angel investors, is that where you like, uh, is it philanthropic uh, uh, donations, and what are you giving to? And I'm like, no, no, this is active. And I'm like, oh, that's a profit, I don't want to do that. I'm like, okay. This is really about empowering our ecosystem and our economic development and building jobs. And that it's going to elevate the entire, you know, it's the rising tide lifts all boats. <laughs> um, and it's finding those people um, that seem to have that resonate with them or successfully exited entrepreneurs themselves that are most interested. Uh, the spousal memberships came about because one of my most active um, uh, investors, uh, his wife was like, I want to understand this better. Um, so I encourage that. I think that's a great way to know, and I think that um, many of the spousal members will ask the questions that other people maybe don't feel comfortable asking, and yet everybody's wondering. Um, I find that particularly now that I have anywhere from five to seven women at the meetings, 
Um, they're asking really good poignant questions and particularly getting noticed when they're coming in with a background in either you know, M&A or, or financial um, analysis and people are, oh, okay. <laughs> so um, it, it's, it's encouraging the members also. I actually made a specific plea to members to try and each bring in a female uh, investor that they thought would be accredited and invite them to, to, to come to the meeting. And with 70 members, if I can get even 10 to do that. That's powerful. Hi, I'm Steve Paul. Oh, yeah. Um, I have just three kind of quick questions. One is deal value for, um, for angels. Are you seeing an increase? And in, in maybe less of an impact in Maine, but as you go down south toward Boston, are you seeing that there's other money coming in beginning to try to get companies in a the stage? So in other words, are you beginning, are you seeing deals that are too expensive? Um, yes and no. Uh, nationally, when, when the um, HALO report tries to uh, uh, accumulate that and collate the information on what are the actual uh, pre-money valuations of the uh, deals that are being closed, we're finding that it is starting to go up. It was um, like two years ago, it was 2.5 million, and um, it's now moved up closer to, I think, 3 million. When we have a deal that comes to us and says, oh, I have a pre-money valuation of 10 million, you sort of think, you know, if this is not something that we can negotiate or we're seeing some sort of basis for that, that's, that's a deal breaker. And then one other good question. From your perspective in Maine, what, what are the real blocks to the success of the angel Related to the state, is it related to the location? What would make your life more easy? Other than having more administrative resources? Um, Other issues, or maybe there aren't. One of the things that was really important for us to do was really build up uh, the resources um, in our ecosystem. I was starting to take some of our uh, Top Gun graduates that were particularly the ones that were women. Uh, entrepreneurs and trying to refer them down to Golden Seeds in Boston, which specifically uh, is restricted to only invest in women uh, owned or significant portion of their um, C-suite has to be a woman. Um, and having the response that our entrepreneurs just weren't ready. So credibility is quality. Um, and showing that they uh, have the savvy and, and the resources. Um, so we've been really focusing on, uh, as, as an ecosystem, not me personally, the main angels, but trying to get them ready. Um, sometimes our investors say we don't have the quality deal flow we're looking for. Um, others, it's like, oh, there's just not the money out there. Um, we get a lot of summer residents that come up to Maine and people that would be interested to invest if they knew about some of those opportunities. So again, it's the connections, it's the communication, um, and I also think it's really making sure that we have the right supports there to help entrepreneurs understand the kind of caliber of deal flow that you get down in Boston. Um, if they don't go in with a powerful presentation and really knock it out of the park, they don't stand a chance. We have a question over here, and please raise your hand if you want to be next. Sandra, Jamie Coffin from Dartmouth College. Hi. Welcome and thank you very much. Where are you seeing the follow-on funding coming from? And what is Maine Angels doing to help steward those additional tranches of capital in support of the deals that you're supporting? Um, if it's a Maine deal, a lot of times it's our member investors that the deal has met a milestone or made um, a significant change or advance. Um, that's not to say that we're also not trying to keep uh, pegged up a, a, an entrepreneur that seems to be finding that their um, projections were unrealistic and that we think they have enough potential not to let them flounder. Um, what I track is just main angel investments. So um, these numbers don't reflect anything in terms of like reaching out to other angel groups and what money those angel groups might have put into it. But um, what has been great is being part of the um, Angel Capital Association, the National Association has the New England uh, Regional Group that as I said has um, summit, uh, quarterly summits. So that if uh, a group that we're invested in needs to go back for another round, 
that's a really good candidate to bring down there. We've already got diligence, we've done, you know, usually some term sheet negotiations, and we've already got money in the deal. And that's what attracts outside angel groups to take a look at our deal flow. Do I see any hands? I'll uh, ask one on the way over, which is, uh, is there, is there a point at which you think you have too many members, or do you keep growing? How do you handle the size issue with, really, with regard to the, the angel group itself? Um, that's actually a question that I keep asking um, my executive committee when I was, uh, the last year I was chair. Um, one of the things I do, because I do track the investments for the HALO report, is to actually notice that um, very often in the first year of membership, um, a new investor wants to spend a little bit of time um, observing, figuring it out, maybe even being part of a deal team but not investing yet. Um, and I was like, well, a couple of these people have been a member for two years and not made an investment. We're, the new leadership team is really trying to get to the point that they're saying, okay, we're expecting five hours a month of something. You're either part of the diligence team, the event, the screening, uh, three hours just coming to the meeting and being part of the networking, being out in the community, trying to bring in new deal flow. Um, but several of our members that left this last year were like, oh, it used to be a really intimate group. I knew everybody. Um, and sometimes you have some really strong uh, lead uh, investors who take, uh, one of my members is like, I haven't met a deal I haven't invested in. I'm like, well, those probably aren't your, your most savvy investors, but um, there are others who people notice like, oh, Mark's in that one? Oh, I'm gonna take a second look at that one. Um, so for us, we're sort of feeling like 100 would be our ceiling, at which point we would start to take a real serious look about exactly what is the quality of our member, uh, what are they bringing to the table. Um, should we, at that point, we probably really would need to be paying for more professional diligence so that we could bring all of the uh, people that maybe weren't at the meeting uh, into the uh, investment pool, so to speak. Um, Launchpad, which is the number one angel group in New England, I believe has well over 100 members. Um, they actually have gone to two separate meetings. They meet at night and then uh, again uh, for lunch or the morning the next day. Um, we're having enough trouble trying to figure out how to do that with Bangor because it's a two hour drive and having people expected to present in two locations I think can be tough. Um, more members up in Bangor or Camden would allow us to be able to afford to video it and make it a lot of fee. Right now, um, it's just not worth a thousand dollars a meeting to us. Don Brown from Kane. Have you seen any trends over the years in the age of our entrepreneurs? In the age of entrepreneurs? Um, hmm. I don't know that I'd say I've seen a trend. I think that one of the things that you're, um, we're seeing is they're not all just younger, uh, under 30. Um, it's sort of like the encore career of people that have um, expertise, meet other people with expertise, and are saying, wow, we could really do something together here. Um, I know that one of our deals, actually the one I had up there, Pika Energy, um, was two young folks and uh, fellas that had an M MIT background had worked out in the Southwest in uh, alternative energy. And uh, it was only when one of my members um, who has some uh, national caliber or sustainability background said, well, I'd be willing to you know, get involved one day a week. And everybody's like, oh, gray hair involved in this. This is more attractive to us. And it, it really helped close that deal um, within our group. Um, so the wisdom and experience counts for quite a bit, and sometimes it's just trying to make sure that they, uh, if it's a younger entrepreneur, they either have the resources or they tap into some of those resources, either an, an advisory council or an board members. But I, I wouldn't say I've seen necessarily a trend either way. We have time for one more question. Hi, I'm Daniel Henderson. I'm also from Keith. Uh, okay. You mentioned economic development earlier. Are you actually tracking local or regional economic development the impact of your investments? Uh, do I track that? No. Um, 
what we have um, is a, a, a pretty, Maine's wonderful, and I think New Hampshire must be somewhat the same, is that we're a small community. Um, you know, I, I can uh, email or call my uh, legislator and they talk to me. I have a spin class with my state senator. Um, yeah. we, we all uh, seem to know each other, so it's more sort of knowing whether things are going well or not and what are we all aiming and, and focused and seem to have not just the dollar sign uh, vision, but how can we really, if, if we can create the support system for those entrepreneurs to be even better and, and have our young people do these internships at, at some of these uh, emerging businesses and go back to campus and go, ah, you should hear about the summer job I have. And I work with this company and now they're going to hire me when I graduate? And people are like, I didn't even know that was here. So um, it's more that having been in the incubator side of it, which was helping the entrepreneurs, and now being on the investor side of it, 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 it it's something that's sort of like a secondary um, objective for our group. I wouldn't say all of them, but um, there's now a main mentor network in Maine. It's um, 80 volunteer mentors to try and help support that system. Um, and then, and that's not even including the ones that are part of the top gun coaching um, volunteers. So. Um, I guess it's more what we're anecdotal. I haven't actually, you know, got any numbers that I can say. It, it is tracked by the SBDC and some of those SBA organizations because they have to. But it's I, I've got enough on my plate. <laughs> Thank you, Sandra, very much. We appreciate it. Very much. Sandra will will be will be with us for the rest of the afternoon. And uh, just by the way, we have a New Hampshire gift basket uh, in the back for you that we hope you enjoy. Uh, we're on our way to a breakdown. Um, we have, uh, let's see, it's 2.45 now. Breakout sessions begin at 3 o'clock. Um, there's, uh, there's a couple of different breakout sessions. One is titled Angel Investing 101. Um, Phil Furneaux over here and Kyle York somewhere in the crowd, hopefully. Uh, we'll be we'll be talking. Uh, um, we'll be we'll be leading that panel. Um, that's uh, directed towards those who don't have either any or very much experience uh, in angel investing, or just have an interest in uh, being in that type of that that particular tips and tricks uh, process of investing workshop. The the other one is more of a national trends discussion. Uh, it includes uh, Professor Jeff Soule, T.K. Kugler, and John Hamilton. And I think that one will be quite interesting as well. Um, there are a number of you who've been invited as leaders of uh, angel groups here in New Hampshire to uh, a private session to talk about what we can all do as members of angel groups and leaders of angel groups. So um, the um, Angel Investing 101 is in P142, which is downstairs. There will be people to help guide you. A session on National Trends and Beyond will be happening in this room and uh, the private